LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Kevin Grubb about preparing students for successful careers and the future of higher education. Kevin Grubb, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Philadelphia area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about preparing students for successful careers and the future of higher education. Uh, Now, we're both in the higher ed space. Um, We're both in the business of trying to prepare students for their futures And I know that this is a little bit more of a niche kind of conversation um, for the audience, but I think it's very important for any leader who who may be part of the audience today to be thinking about, um, you know, students as we define them, you know, 18 to 22 year old, kind of the traditional student, that kind of model of student is kind of changing anyways. Uh, And most organizations need to be very thoughtful about how they're reskilling and upskilling their people, uh, employees and workers within their teams um, to prepare them for the future of work. So when when I talk about the future of higher education, of course, that means in the university space, as we are both in, but it also means within the corporate space, how do we reskill and upskill our people in real time? And how do we prepare people for, for meaningful, purposeful careers, whether they're coming, you know, through a traditional university kind of a higher ed system, or they're, they're joining our organization and getting trained there. Uh, either way, we need to be thinking about these things. We need to be talking about these things. And so that's what we're going to be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Kevin's bio with everybody. Kevin Grubb is an internationally nationally recognized expert on career services delivery in higher education. Currently, Kevin serves as Villanova University's Associate Vice President provost for career and professional development and has held multiple roles within Villanova's career center over the last 13 years. In his current position, he is responsible for the strategic direction of the university's career and professional development functions, leading cross-university task forces and spearheading institutional projects to help and enhance college to career success. Kevin's expertise focuses on community-driven approaches to career education, a high-tech, high-touch approach, and prioritizes equitable access to career services, especially for those who have been historically excluded from higher education. A pleasure again, Kevin, to have you. Anything else you would like to share with me or the audience by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? Not much, John, but I will just give a big plus one to everything you said about the relevance of this conversation to leaders in the workplace and in thinking about what higher education means, upskilling, mm-hmm. reskilling, certainly that um, we're not just talking about a what might be in, considered as a traditional college age student. We're thinking about the long term and the long tail of education, training, uh, workforce preparedness. It's critical. Um, yeah. And hopefully that will come through in the conversation for folks to be thinking about the future of their workforces in partnership with higher ed. Wonderful. Excellent. And I also should say, and and feel free to chime in on this point um, as well, you know, in your experience at Villanova, but I know at my university, we we are putting a lot of attention. Of course, we have our traditional, you know, four-year degree programs, our master's degree programs, et cetera. 
But we've been putting a lot of emphasis in recent years on stackable credentials, mm-hmm. on certificates, mm-hmm. um, on on other types of approaches that might not be the way you know you as the audience um, experienced higher ed. So mm-hmm. I think this shift has already been happening in higher ed. I think it's we're continuing the pendulum's continuing to swing that way so that we can be more responsive to industry, so we can you know level up and make sure that we're preparing students to be you know hit the ground running in their careers. I think we're doing a much better job. Certainly at my university, I feel like we're doing a, a, a very good job of that, much better than we were ten years ago. Um, and yeah, w- what are you doing at Villanova to prepare students for their successful careers? Well, we're right in line with you on, uh, what you mentioned on, um, thinking about stackable credentials, thinking about certificates, thinking about the adult learner. Um, so continuous education, um, and learning for life. So that's incredibly important, um, to Villanova. Um, so that very much, uh, exists. Uh, at Villanova too, uh, and I'm I've been really excited about the developments in that, and have worked closely with some of our academic leaders on developing those programs, thinking about reshaping those programs. Um, we have a lot of dialogue with industry, um, a lot of times via our alumni who are we're blessed to have an incredibly active alumni community who are very senior in their organizations to give us insights about what we should be thinking about. Um, with respect to the future of their workforces and what credentials we should be developing. Um, so it's it, that's an exciting time. Um, I think it, it can seem potentially scary to higher education, but it also represents an incredible opportunity uh, for us to do something different and try something different. So um, also a plus yeah. one on that. Um, what Villanova is doing to prepare students, um, and I'll say students broadly, so not just undergraduate students, but our graduate students, our certificate students, our adult learners, is thinking about really how we can embed practical learning, real-time learning, um, connections, networking into the student experience. So not looking at that as something separate from their academic journey, um, really looking at this holistically. Um, you mentioned something in my bio that's really important to me, and that's about equitable access to things. And what that really means is we have to think about designing the career education and career services experience with equity in mind. Um, And that Mm -hmm. means thinking about how we systemically embed career education, connections, uh, industry opportunities, practical experience into the experience so that we're sure people have both the incredible knowledge and intellectual experience that is gained from the classroom and our renowned faculty, as well as the opportunity to make meaningful connection between that kind of learning, which is incredibly dynamic in and of itself, but more dynamic learning that connects it to what might be opportunities for them beyond our spaces, uh, virtually and uh, physically at the university. So we are embedding these concepts um, into the student experience um, at every turn um, and partnering with faculty, partnering with academic leaders to make sure that those things happen, um, which gives our students the best chance of then taking what they've learned in whatever degree program or credential program they're in and applying it to where they want to go next and being ready for those opportunities when they come. So that's a, a big focus uh, for us is is not having this career services or career education, career preparedness thing be a a volitional, voluntary thing you have to find, but that we are Mm. reaching and getting to you um, to make sure that it it is front and center with you at the moments that it needs to be. And then obviously you can seek out more resources and support as might be needed, um, but making sure it's really there with you along the way. Yeah, embedding it in the student experience along the way is, I think, very, very important, especially for, you know, what we often refer to as non-traditional students, first-time college students, first-generation college students, et cetera. Um, They they just need more of that, and they don't know where to go seek it out, um, or they don't even know it's available to seek out, right? Right. Uh, And so all of that's really important. And again, coming back to the workplace, if we zoom out from the university space for a second, and we, we think about education more generally, lifelong learning more generally. And we mm-hmm. think about career preparation from mm-hmm. an organizational lens. Yes. You know, what are you, what are you doing 
within your organization, within your team. If you're a really large large corporation, you probably have an internal L and D or training and development team. Um, mm-hmm. You you have you know various face to face class settings. You have online virtual types of learning opportunities. You have a whole range of things that are done often in real time as needs arise, etc. Um, but what what are you doing? Um, you know, this is a hypothetical for any listener. What are you doing uh, within your organization? Uh, to to be preparing um, your people for an uncertain future and to help them develop the skills, not only to do their job of today well, but mm-hmm. to do the job of tomorrow better, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a challenging thing. And unless we're very proactive about it, and unless we're very mindful about how to embed it throughout the systems of the organization, it's not just going to magically happen. <laughs> you no. can have, you know, I've seen organizations that have a really nice catalog of like all these trainings. And so if someone's really proactive, they can go in, they can find it, they can find ones they're interested in, maybe set a goal with their boss, do this training, et cetera. That's very common in a lot of organizations. What we're suggesting is you need to be more deliberate than that, than just having like a, a a catalog of options. And then people can kind of randomly go find what's interesting to them. Um, Be more deliberate, assess people's skills and competencies and capabilities uh, and, and, Think about succession planning. Think about how you're developing people. Again, not just for today, but for tomorrow. I completely agree with that. And to add in a little more to that is to think as leaders of these organizations, um, if the students of today, and again, thinking of students broadly here, you know, of all degree programs and credentials, if institutions of higher education are starting to move in the direction that we are moving at Villanova and have moved for a while um, of embedding this stuff, that when these folks complete those programs and come to you, they are going to be possibly expecting the same sort of built-in experience, right? Not this, I have to go find it, or it's hard to get to, or it's only if I'm available at this day and time, or only if I have a good manager who gets it. Um, if that's not sort of part of the fabric of your culture, um, we we are we are working on preparing that to be part of our culture. And so it might be a misalignment then culturally for your organization to not have that as as woven into the experience. Um, because that is just at this point, you know, what is an expectation for folks? Um, so if you can meet that expectation, recognizing that every organization has different capacities for this, um, you will likely be better prepared to meet the needs of the next generation of talent to be an attractive destination from a recruiting perspective or sourcing perspective for candidates, because you'll be able to talk about that in a way that aligns with the kinds of experiences that they are becoming used to having, um, and start to expect to happen. Um, So there's a, a, I I think a little bit of a shift here from sort of a grow your own way kind of philosophy, um, which certainly that autonomy and choice is still needed, but grow your own way with some structure we've built. You know, we're making sure that it's there for you. um, And it's not so difficult um, to find, get to, and participate in. Um, And and if you can create those things, you'll just be more competitive. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting too, as you're describing all of that, what you're describing is a shift in the way we're approaching university education and, and student support, which is shifting the the student mindset and the, the new professional mindset of people coming into the workforce. And this is something I've been thinking about for a long time, actually, you know, in relation, now we're talking about Gen Z workers entering the workforce. Um, you go back in time, 10 years, we were talking about millennials entering the workforce and all the grumbling about all these entitled millennials or these entitled Gen Z people. They they expect all these things like unreasonable expectations. Why do they expect leaders to behave in these ways? Why do they expect all of this type of support, et cetera? And I'm like, well, in large part, it's because people like you and me in a university space have been um, telling them that this is the way good organizations run. This is the way that good leaders lead. Uh, you know, I, t- I teach HR, I teach organizational development, I teach leadership and my students come out, you know, hopefully having a much clearer picture of what a good leader looks like and how they can go about 
effective leadership. And they know when they're being exploited. They know when they're being mm -hmm. taken advantage of. They know when they're being micromanaged. They know that these things aren't effective. They know that they're not the ideal. And so on the one hand, when they get into your organization, you could feel like, oh, they're entitled because they're not willing to put up with my bad leadership like other employees in the past have been. I don't see that as entitlement. I just see, see that as raising the bar in terms of expectation for what a good leader should be doing anyways. Mm -hmm. So from a leadership perspective, that's something I've been thinking about for a long time. But as you're saying, from a career development perspective, it's the same kind of an idea that the, the it's shifting in the mindset of younger students and younger workers about what the role of an organization should be in preparing them to be successful in life, to be successful in their career. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you can, grumble about it all you want. You can say you don't like it. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter because that's the new reality. And if you want to attract and retain good talent, you you better figure out a way to adapt so that people will want to come work for you. Mm. And you bring up a very interesting point that I think is a something we are all developing more competence in, which is intergenerational diversity and an understanding of generational expectations and mindsets, which is an important component of what we should be thinking about when we think about a diverse workforce. Um, <clears throat> and I would say some of the things that you said sort of at the end of your notes there, John, um, you know, people want to be supported by good people. People want development opportunities. People want to feel heard. People want to feel like they're cared for. They might all be expressed in different ways by different generations, but fundamentally those are human needs. Um, it doesn't matter what generation you're from. Those things all feel good to all of us. Um, so at, at the bottom line, it's all human. You know, we're all still humans. And how we express that might show up differently. But if we can recognize that commonality among us, that that is just a human desire to be cared for, to feel like people are looking out for you, to feel like, you know, there's a there's a way to develop and grow. Um, and if that is made clearer, you know, because there's a path that's been laid out for you or some structure that's been built in for you, all the better. Um, so we just are getting smarter and smarter at doing that and, and hearing it and knowing how to respond to it, which is a great thing. You know, we're advancing, um, which means, you know, also we might be hearing different, maybe you would call them complaints or concerns or grumblings, but we're hearing them differently because we built a better system. Um, so, you know, hopefully that can be words of encouragement for folks who may, feel like, oh, this generation XYZ or that generation XYZ, I think all generations can point the finger at other generations um, to our own detriment rather than trying to see, you know, what might be the common human need underneath it. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk a little bit more. We've already talked a little bit about some of what you're doing at Villanova and some of the these shifts in the way we're approaching higher ed. What are some of the other changing aspects of the landscape of higher education uh, with respect to increased expectations um, of students and, and workers, but also in terms of return on investment uh, mm -hmm. for the university experience? Yeah. Well, I think um, the any prospective student of any program is, is asking um, specific questions about what the outcomes of that might be. And we, well, that experience, that educational experience might be. And we see a lot of organizations working to articulate that for people not only higher education institutions themselves, but you know other parties who try to quantify what that might look like. Um, and certainly that stepped up um, the impetus and need for higher education institutions to think about those measures, right? That we want to be able to communicate. So it is moving us in the direction of having some more clear articulation and tracking of the outcomes that students might uh, get from programs. Um, one thing I'll, I'll plug, uh, about Villanova that I'm really proud of in that shift is we have a pretty concise and clear website that articulates the outcomes of our degree programs. And particularly this one focuses on our undergraduate programs and it's outcomes.villanova.edu. So it's an interactive website where you can click on specific programs from specific academic years and see um, successful placement rates, uh, sample destinations where people have gone, um, the average salaries for people, um, we added some new data this year because while salary is certainly an important metric, of course, it is not the only metric that measures success and happiness for people. Um, so we've added in questions about whether students feel like their first destination is something that will help them achieve their career goals, 
about 93 or 94% of students agree to that every year, which is incredible. So not only are we achieving success and helping them land somewhere, but they also feel positively about it, um, which is fantastic. So there's a lot more that higher education is doing in terms of measuring, tracking, reporting, and talking about um, what those outcomes might be, which is difficult, you know, to capture. What is what is a happy life? You know, what is a, a successful life? But that's really important. Um, something that we've already touched on a little bit in this conversation is another thing I'll mention, and that is just tighter connection with industry um, and thinking about how to build industry relevant skills or credentials into experiences. Um, at Villanova, we have um, a lot of advisory boards um, for academic departments, for uh, specific um, groups of departments, for um, <clears throat> entire colleges, so that we can be capturing information from largely our alumni and even sometimes our parent communities of what's going on out there in your space right now. And here's some updates from us and what we've been doing and times for us to share feedback with each other in real time um, so that we can be developing things in a way that that makes a lot of sense. A specific example of that um, in our engineering, our College of Engineering, we have a professional development program that's called Career Compass. It's a partnership between the college itself and the career center of the university. Um, and it is like an incredibly blossoming partnership that has yielded a lot of success. Um, in a recent accreditation review of the college, they sort of lauded that as one of the greatest things about the college, that we have this pretty unique partnership that delivers education to students on career professional development. And there's an advisory board specifically for that program so that we can get feedback from engineers uh, and people who graduated from engineering and are doing different careers, not maybe in a traditional engineering path, about what sorts of things an engineering degree prepares you for and how that how we can expose students to that information and knowledge so they can make informed choices. So those kinds of connections um, are becoming more essential in understanding, you know, the degree experience and, and how we can make sure that students are prepared. Yeah, wonderful. And just the other day, uh, on Tuesday, we had one of our big advisory board meetings for um, one of the programs in my department. I'm chair of our department, um, the HR program. We had 20 or so uh, professional executive HR people who are part of our advisory board come in. We had breakfast. We had a big conversation, talked about all these different things, got a lot of input from them. That's something we do every semester. Uh, and all of the programs in the School of Business do the same thing. Um, to your point, like I, I get the the complaints that people have about higher ed um, that we're we're behind the times, we're too slow to adapt, we're um, we're not really truly preparing people for the current workplace, etc. And I think that there, you know, there, there's val there's validity in some of those critiques to a point. But I also think that people aren't recognizing that higher ed has shifted already quite a bit and is continuing to shift. And so just because that's, you know, you're thinking about how it was when you went to university, that, that doesn't mean that it is the way it is now. Like we have very embedded programs with industry. We're making sure that all of our credentials, all of our certificates, all of our courses within our major programs are um, timely, applicable, that they're adapted and updated in real time um, so that when we send students out, whether it's for internships or for class projects or for a full-time position, that they're ready to hit the ground running. I talk about having shovel-ready students. Like they come out of the university setting, they're not green. Like they already know what to do and they're going to be able to come in and make a contribution to your organization. That's the type of students that we produce at my university. It sounds like it's the same kind of students you're producing at your university. I think that's becoming more and more common at universities, um, generally speaking, which is a good development. Um, do you, do you see other shifts and developments in the higher ed space, um, in this regard uh, around I ROI? Mm. Um, well, one thing I want to just jump in and also mention before I answer that question, uh, came to me as you were speaking, which is, I think, um, one comment that I feel like I hear or a theme I'll say I hear, uh, from folks, um, is this debate a little bit about higher education um, and its purpose, right? Is is its purpose to prepare people for work? Is its purpose to produce great citizens? Um, and that can become an either or 
kind of conversation. And my usual challenge to people is this should be a both and conversation. Yeah. You, as you say that, I'm like, yes. And yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so it is. And, and so for our, you know, our folks who are in industry and who are thinking higher ed needs to do more to prepare people for industries and the workforce and uh, yep, absolutely. We should. And we're working on it. Um, we also have a larger responsibility and larger calling um, than simply preparing people for a workforce, because what we are hoping to do is develop great citizens who are also great employees and ready to work uh, and, again, earn a living that you know sustains them and builds futures for them and future families Um but also that they, you know, can be active contributors to an evolving society, that we can have meaningful conversations that contribute more broadly um, to the world that we live in beyond work. Um, work is very important. Work gives you a sense of purpose. It is important for well-being to have a purpose. Um, so it's critical. Um, and it's important that we have an educated society. Um, so it's 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 not a um, they can't be mutually exclusive things and they each have specific objectives um, and and things that we have to do as a university to deliver on that kind of mission. So I would also offer that when people think about oh higher ed is slow to change and sure there are some days when even I'm thinking oh my goodness this is going to take a while <laughs> and I feel there's an urgency here but it's important to be able to wrestle with those things because the 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 long arc of what we're all shooting for is often something that takes more time to really make a good decision about an educated and smart decision about. So I'd offer that first. Um, yeah. And then in terms of your question about, is there more that people are doing on ROI? Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's even more of the sophisticated relationships and embedding that we talked about before, just continuing to think about making sure that these kinds of experiences are embedded and that practical experience is woven in and practical experience. I, I, I think of and refer to um, incredibly well-researched and documented what are called high-impact practices in teaching and learning. So making sure that we have those high-impact practices as part of the experience so that students feel like the education is valuable, they can take the most rich learning from it, um, and again, make sure that it's applied to something that will be long-term something they want to focus on. Well said, Kevin. I, I'm a big believer in high-impact practices. That's something um, that we focus on heavily, heavily, heavily at my university. I know it's it's uh, getting a lot of time and play in in a lot of universities, and pretty much all the universities I'm associated with or I've interacted with. It, this is is part of the bigger arc, like you said, of thinking through deep learning experiences for students to to make sure that they not only are active citizens. Um, contributing back to the world, um, broadly speaking, but also prepared uh, for careers and prepared to make a difference, you know, in business and in in uh, other organizations. This has been a really great conversation. I note the time I'm going to have to let you go, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Um, so I'd love to connect with folks in, in the audience. Thank you for listening. Um, best way to connect with me is find me on LinkedIn. Um, Kevin Grubb is my name on LinkedIn. You can certainly find me by looking for um, Villanova University and Kevin Grubb. I'll be right there, uh, top of the list for you to connect with. Um, our website for the, the Career Center at Villanova, which is where you'd find me, or under the provost's office is where you'd find me, but the Career Center is careers.villanova.edu. So please feel free to check that out. And my contact information is there. Um, one note that I guess I leave uh, the, the group with is um, there's going to be more evolution in um, career services and higher education over the years. We're starting to see a lot of institutions elevate the senior leader of this role to something higher to really think about how this is embedded. So back to your ROI question, John, you know, that's another thing that is changing. Um, and as you folks out there in industry and, and who are leaders, as you have spaces of influence um, at institutions, I would encourage you to keep pushing for that. Um, keep asking, um, because it is something that institutions are listening to and are listening to in a very different way. And there are a lot of people out there who want to make that change along with you and partner with you. So um, please, please do 
you know, think about your institutions of higher education around you, reach out to leaders at those institutions, encourage them to be thinking about these kinds of learning experiences and partnerships. Institutions can help you with not only the kind of research and experimentation and discovery you want to do, but also helping you get great talent. Yeah. Um, so make sure to stay with us. Wonderful. Thank you, Kevin. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Kevin can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.